When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be confusing. Like Swedish techno confusing. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Dance with me, purple cow. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Ooh, you lovely cow. Geico makes it easy. With 24-7 access, all you have to do is go to Geico.com and you could save money on car insurance. It just makes sense. Unlike, you know. Dance with me, purple cow. I like your moves. Blog Talk Radio. Join us for today's episode of the Utopian Realities Slope Save Life on Planet Earth Blog Talk Radio Show bringing you solution bearers with practical, proven, scientific ways to help you eliminate global-level irradiation and extinction-level threats from your body and bringing forward the means to restore and sustain global waters, air, soil, and sentient life. Welcome. Greetings, this is Lisa Wolf, your host. Welcome to the Utopian Realities, From Concept to Planetary Restoration, Slope, Save, Sustain Life on Planet Earth, Earth Aid, Sunday Solution Bearers Forum, where we give people with real solutions to global crises a platform to inform you, the listeners, about ways to address pressing problems we all face. Today's guest, Alaska State Common Law Judge, Anna Von Rietz is working to open the world's first universal common law bank. She's a world famous common law scholar and speaker. Her bank is based on an alliance between two sovereign indigenous tribes. Anna was born and raised in the Midwest and started out as a mathematician and scientist. She admittedly had no interest in law as a subject, much less as a profession, and would have been happy to spend her days studying histology and plasma physics, either one or both. A chance snippet of news coverage on C-SPAN during the confirmation hearings of Nelson Rockefeller as Gerald Ford's vice president began an inexorable life-changing process for Anna. Mr. Rockefeller was asked how much money he made the prior year. He answered something like $480 million, a very large amount of money in those days. Next, he was asked how much federal income tax he paid, and the answer came back, none. After a few moments of stunned silence, the question was rephrased, and again, the answer was none. No federal taxes paid at all. The question of how and why Nelson Rockefeller could be exempt from federal taxation while millions of average Americans are forced to give up more than 40% of their earnings each year, nagged at Anna, who unwillingly began to use her investigative and analytical skills to investigate the Internal Revenue Service, which, like unraveling a spider's web, led inexorably to more questions. Today, she credits many, many other Americans who came before and who work towards the same ends today with the progress that is being made to restore lawful government and promote the rights of living people worldwide. I don't want to focus, I don't want the focus to be on me, and I don't want people to think that I am anyone so special because that keeps them from focusing on the issues and the facts and their own empowerment, she said recently. We all have to pick up an oar to get our ship to depend on anyone else, however well-intentioned, to do it for us. She lives with her husband and a cavalcade of dogs, plus one ornery old she-cat in Alaska, which has been her primary home since 1981. Welcome, Judge Anna. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, um, in February of 2016, you wrote a clarification. If you if you don't mind my um, taking a couple of minutes to read it, 
and I and I want to thank all of our um, listeners and guests who are um, on the air with us. Um, I'm um, glad that you're all here, and uh, we will be taking questions later. In any case, in February of 2016, Judge Anna, you wrote, um, I am not a legal counsel for the general, Dunford. We are all working on reclaiming American assets for Americans. For right now, it's improper to call what we are doing a new republic. That will require a public education process, each one making their political status, citizenship, etc. choices, the election of fiduciary deputies from each state to attend a continental congress to either amend or abolish the existing actual constitution. For now, we have saved the Constitution for the United States of America. The rats sought to vacate the contract by entering the all naming a successor to contract. That left the federal side of the contract vacant and flapping in the wind. We formed an agreement with the American Native Nations, the Athabasca and Lakota, to fulfill the federal side. We issued two sets of sovereign letters patent, one to reaffirm the United States of America with the United in lowercase, and one to establish a new arrangement with the Native people to bring them out of their POW status and incarceration in the jurisdiction of the sea and put them back on the land as free, sovereign, and independent people. We then sealed this arrangement with a declaration of joint sovereignty spelling out the intent of our actions. These actions were sent by registered mail to the Pope, the Queen, the UN Security Council, the United Nations Secretary General, and others. For the first time since the original Constitution was adopted, the federal side of the contract is now in the hands of Americans devoted to America, not British Federal Reserve or French IMF interlopers. For the first time, the federal agents have a vested interest in truly and honestly protecting America and Americans because if they hurt or plunder us, they hurt and plunder themselves. And now we are all going after the assets that are owed to Americans, which have been purloined by international banks and the governmental services corporations. They have run as storefronts under conditions of gross fraud and deceit. And you say, <clears throat> yes. So, Anna, for those listeners who just fell off the turnip truck, tell us what we're dealing with here and why it's so important. I'm sorry. And how did a grandmother from Alaska end up leading the charge to right wrongs? And what are the wrongs? Well, the deeper you go into this, the more outrageous it becomes. Um, we've discovered that the criminality and the audacity and the arrogance of the criminals has no apparent bounds. They even went so far as to patent their fraud process. I want you to think about that for a moment. If you were engaged in criminal activity, something that is forbidden by international law, something that is a recognized war crime throughout the world, in, and engaged in crimes like inland piracy and uh, human enslavement and um, press ganging, things that have been outlawed for 200 years, would you go to the patent office and write down step by step what you were doing and how you were doing it and and secure a patent on it? <laughs> That's what these well. did. That's what they've done. And as a result, we have it step by step, blow by blow, piece by piece, exactly who did what, when, and where. There is no doubt whatsoever. And, uh, you know, it, it's a situation so crazy that it rather defies description. When we first realized what they had done 
and how they had worked this entire scam, uh, it was bad enough because uh, it was apparent that, for example, in the confusion after the Civil War, instead of um, you know going back to the lawful government, the Congress at that time, the so-called Rump Congress, the 39th Congress, uh, continued operating as if it were in an emergency status uh, that President Lincoln had set up during the war. Uh, they did not sign a peace treaty ending the Civil War, and they continued to operate as a corporation. Now, people, you don't think about it. You know, we take corporations for granted. But when you stop operating as an unincorporated entity and start operating as an incorporated entity, uh, you change your jurisdiction. And all unincorporated organizations, international organizations even, are organizations that operate in the jurisdiction of the land. And when you operate in that jurisdiction, you are 100% commercially liable. You're accountable for your actions and your deeds and your words and your promises. And if you harm someone or their property, then you have to be accountable for it. And that's what's so very comforting about the law of the land. The, for example, the Constitution is law of the land. Um, so that, that establishes a benchmark for behavior and for um, responsibility and accountability for your acts. When you go and incorporate, it takes it into the foreign jurisdiction, the international jurisdiction of the sea, and that operates under an entirely different law form. Uh, one from the biblical side of it, it's the law of Noah. And it oh. vastly predates the law of Moses, which was the law of the land, the Ten Commandments, for example. Um, the law of Noah is a, a pirate's law. It is no law. It has rules, but it doesn't provide for accountability. So when uh-huh. we began operating our our the government, the federal government, as a corporation after the Civil War, they took it out into international jurisdiction and they continued to fight. They continued to remain in a status of war. They've been under martial law since 1861. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, they're they're operating in a totally different jurisdiction than the, than the people on the land, right? Right. And we discovered all this, which was jaw dropping enough. But then we discovered that they had actually usurped onto the land and had taken over step by step all of the counties and states on the land by incorporating them as franchises of the federal corporation. So first you've got this federal corporation acting in a completely illegal, unlawful, crazy way after the Civil War. And then you've got that corporation and its um, successors promoting the same sort of thing uh, with the state and with the counties, wanting them to incorporate and function as incorporated entities. Mm-hmm. Take them out into the jurisdiction of the sea. Uh, we're getting a lot of feedback here. I don't know if you can hear that. but Yes, I, I think um, there's a um, listener. Could you um, please mute your phone? We're getting feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, so if that makes any sense, our, our, the basic form of our government, ex- externally it looks the same, but in terms of its jurisdiction, totally different. So who are oh. they? 
who who are they, I... Judge Anna? The banks. International Central Banks are at the bottom of all of this. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to continue this conversation if they don't mute their I mean there's no point yeah. in continuing. Um listener, um listener, please mute. Okay. Okay, and hold on. Okay. Um, I think we can go on. Okay. Um, so all of this was pulled off by foreign governments, uh, international central banks, and they essentially have operated our government as a puppet government and have had storefronts, repeated storefronts. Uh, they had the United States of America incorporated. Then... Uh, They bankrupted that in 1933, and a new storefront operated by the French government came in, the United States Incorporated. And now they've just most recently tried to pull off uh, the United States of America in all caps, another incorporated governmental services corporation, to provide services. Um, At this point, both the... United States, which is under liquidation. I said in February it was a bankruptcy, but it's it's actually a bankruptcy that's gone into liquidation. They could no longer even pay the um, interest on their debts. And so they didn't even qualify for bankruptcy. And they are being liquidated. And where, where is this taking place, Judge Anna, this liquidation? And why is the mass population not aware of it. Well, these are these are all private corporations, and so we're dealing with private bankruptcies. And the parent corporations keep these things very tightly um, under wraps, so that those who are um, affected by it have to deal through trustees that are established by the banks. And in our case, the U.S. trustees are uh, the ones who are tasked with dealing with claims related to the bankruptcy. And we'll get to that for a moment. Um, Each one of us has a, um, what you would call a construction trust that has been established in our names. And it is actually a group of different doing business names. Uh, For example, uh, you might have John Henry Doe in all capital letters, Uh and then you might have John H. Doe in all capital letters. Uh, You might have uh, J. H. Doe in all caps. They play around with these things, and they come up with all these different versions of your name, your given name, which they've stolen. And they uh, make them franchises of their corporations. And then they set out bonds uh, based on things that, that you have entered into contract with them on. Anyway... Those that belong to the United States are being liquidated. And for most of us, that means a lot of of, uh, money that we've paid out for things like utility bills and mortgages and um, licenses and all sorts of things. Uh, We're the priority creditors. We're the secured creditors. We're the holders in due course of our given name, and we can prove that with an authenticated birth certificate. But if we don't know that we need to come forward and claim our estate, then it will get liquidated and given to secondary creditors. And that's what they did in 1933 through 1999 that was so profitable for them that they decided to try to do it again. 
And this is where we intercepted the entire process. They've tried numerous ways and numerous times to claim our land from us. The big prize is the land and everything that sits upon it, the homes, the businesses. They're after our assets. And they hope to do this by bringing claims as secondary creditors. Um, and the, the real, really the only way to stop them is to bring claim as priority creditors. So what we did in February, first of all, was to let them know that we're still here, we're still alive, and we're still watching the game, and um, to do an end run around their attempt to vacate the federal constitution. Because if, in order for that to stand, you have to have viable states, and you have to have a viable federal partner. And when they were in the business of liquidating the federal partner, uh, there was no relationship. There was no longer anything there except a trustee. Uh-huh. And so that's why that's why we did it the way we did it to um, you know form a relationship with the uh, American Native uh, corporations, and then we came back around and. They were trying to do the same thing on a state-by-state basis. Essentially, they were not not leaving the federal side flapping, but they were um, coming in and claiming that our states no longer existed and that there were no longer any progeny of the people that were claiming uh, the land mass of the state. So they've tried wow. twice now by, by different routes to kill off the American Republic. They've, they've tried to get the actual states that we think of on the land declared non-existent or, you know, that they've died of natural causes. And all, all of the people that were the progeny of the founders that were owed the guarantees of the Constitution and all the other treaties, uh, they have claimed that we're all gone, that uh, there are no longer any of us alive. And or that we've gone on and and voluntarily changed our status to such a a degree and in a way that um, makes us unable to claim our birthright. Well, we spent the last three, four months investigating um, people who have claims that go back to the 1800s. And uh, if your grandfathers were here prior to the um, British Municipal Corporation's enactment in 1888, then you're grandfathered in to a claim on the states. And so it was necessary to go back and find people that had grandfathers who were here prior to those days and, um, and then go back and reclaim all the states, which Uh is what happened this in the last uh, few weeks, we got all of that put together and brought that forward to the world. Um, this is not a happy story. We have been set upon by criminals at every at every possible juncture, and their intent has been to kill off our republic replace it with a bankrupt democracy and then liquidate the assets of that democracy in payment of their own debts. It's basically a gigantic it's identity theft. Yeah, it's piracy mm-hmm. and coupled with a giant identity theft swindle. <laughs> now, basically, um, they're, they're trying to steal yeah. our identity. So, um, and... and and, and then on top of it, you know, we're, we're dealing with all these realities. We're seeing how this is moving uh, on the international level, and we're seeing all of the different banks coming forward with these false uh, statements and, and claims and, and all these political entities that have been uh, colluding with the banks, uh, pulling various different little um, actions trying to support the banks, right? 
And right. Then we go to the patent office, and we go, oh, my. <laughs> Here it is. They, it, they were so greedy. They were so mindlessly greedy that they wanted to patent and trademark their crime. And so oh, that wow. is, in black and white, in their own words, what they did, how they did it, why they did it, how it works, it's incredible. And Is there some way there. you can direct listeners so they can read that for themselves, Judge Anna? Is, well, is there it, somewhere requires that can be? Of, it requires a schematic, you know. It's like patent so-and-so links to patent so-and-so links to patent so-and-so, you know. And so you have to have uh-huh. the schematic, sort of the roadmap there to look at. And we're going uh-huh. to publish. We're going to publish that, so that people can see how this was built, and who built it. But at the same time, uh, we're preparing numerous actions um, to object to this and to um, bring it forward in the right venues to address it uh, as crime. Now, as you yes. all noticed, the, uh, the the entire system, the judicial system, no longer works. Um, it's spent, as you can see from... There, there, there's the FBI director standing there saying, yes, Hillary Clinton definitely violated numerous aspects of the law, but we're not going to prosecute her, <laughs> okay? Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. So, yeah. It's so, it's like in Superman, remember when Superman goes to Bizarro World? <laughs> yes, right. You know, exactly. it's just so strange. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, and so you take um, these complaints to the district attorney and he looks at you like you're insane and he says, I'm not going to prosecute that. Right? Right, right, right. Right. So what do you do? Um, <clears throat> that whole the whole topic of you know, and do you think do all of the um, lawyers who are um, registered with the bar do they all know what's going on or some of them? I mean, are they all complicit or are some of them just really unaware? Oh, I would say somewhere in neighborhood of 90% of of all bar members are substantially, if not entirely, unaware. And another 5% know that something really skullduggerous and awful is going on, but they don't know exactly what. And, you know, they may have some some little piece or part of the problem that is pretty clear to them, but they don't, generally speaking, see the big picture and the evil of what they're doing. And well, those who <clears throat> do... Um, is that your dog barking, Judge Anna? No. Nope, not my dog. Okay. Um, I believe that um, um, Professor John Searle, the godfather of free energy, is um, is on the call with us. I think he's on this line. And Professor and, and Judith, I would ask you if if you could mute your phone because we're hearing the dogs barking. I'm very glad you're with us. <laughs> um, mute the phone. I'd appreciate it. Um, Judge Anna, wasn't it originally um, when the country was founded, um, attorneys couldn't um, hold public office? Um, there were some major um, limitations on uh, attorneys, weren't there? Oh, well, from the very beginning, there was a uh, codicil in the Constitution that prohibits the um, receipt of titles of nobility and presence and emoluments from um, foreign dignitaries and princes because uh, the founders wanted to be sure that the people that worked for our government really worked for our government and weren't uh, being paid on the side by somebody else to work for a foreign government. 
And uh-huh. so they set that up. But when they set it up, they did not, it's always been there. But when they set it up, they didn't prescribe a punishment for it. They didn't say, okay, oh. there shall be no title nobility, and if there are, then blah, blah, blah. Okay, so um, uh-huh. back in like 1802, a uh, movement began to correct that and to actually put an amendment in place that would stipulate punishment for those who were in receipt of a title of nobility from a foreign government and uh, to put an an end to it because by that time it had become clear that the uh, bar associations and and lawyers' guilds were a problem because they were loyal to the king and they were causing problems. So in 1819, Virginia became the last state to uh, ratify what's known as TONA, the Titles of Nobility Amendment, which became the 13th Uh Amendment to the actual Constitution. And it basically provides that they shall lose their citizenship and um, suffer other losses as a result of of accepting a foreign title of nobility and being associated with our government. Now, um, all of the research has been done. It has been proven that the title of nobility was passed and uh, that, in fact, uh, anyone who carries the the office of Esquire in the bar Uh is under that. So, yeah, substantially, bar association members should not be holding public office. And, um, and that would include the President of the United States. Is he not a member of the bar? Uh, yep. Well, he, he's graduate not a member of, of the Harvard bar. Graduate of Harvard Law he, School? Yes, well, oh. he, he, yes he, was from, he went to Harvard and all of that, but he uh, has not had a bar association license for some years, and neither has his wife. Um, however... You know, if if somebody gives up their title and their license, well, then they're in a different status again. But there are uh-huh. an awful lot of members of Congress who are card-carrying attorneys. And none of those people should have anything to do with our government. So uh, all of this goes goes back to also to Hamilton and Jefferson and um, the attempts to um, establish a um, a bank, does it not? Which was um, which usurps the authority of um, Congress? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And you know, I, I want to turn to the topic of um, the Federal Reserve in this um, ignominy that we're dealing with. Um, G. Edward Griffin in The Creature from Jekyll Island, which I recommend listeners read if you haven't, says the Federal Reserve System should be abolished for the following reasons. It is incapable of accomplishing its stated objectives. It is a cartel operating against the public interest. It is the supreme instrument of usury. It generates our most unfair tax. It encourages war. It destabilizes the economy. It is an instrument of totalitarianism. And um, let's talk a little bit about um, the um, the bringing of um, of this um, creature to these lands, and then turn to um, what you're trying to do to um, to establish a um, a more just and lawful um, bank system. Well, so, the creature. Um, a number of things happened, and if, if you read our estate claim letter that was addressed to Pope Francis this past week, uh, you saw that 
our government had been taken into this foreign jurisdiction. The federal side of the government was operating in the foreign jurisdiction as a corporation, which it was never designed to do. And um, the the uh, Holy See had its fingers in this process, and so did the British monarch. So in 1908, um, they they really made their big move uh, to bring everything under ecclesiastical law and to incorporate um, more and more and more of the government as franchises and and to bring forward this whole system of dead corporate entities being in control of government functions and uh-huh. so. The the corporate Congress was already operating as a board of directors for the United States of America Incorporated, um, went ahead and abdicated its responsibility to control the money. And if you read the Constitution, you'll see that one of Congress's chief responsibilities is is to deal with the money, to safeguard the nation's money and, and to provide for it and blah, blah. So they abdicated that responsibility in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act, and they handed that all over to the Federal Reserve, which is nothing but a private banking cartel, mostly European. And so then we got the the whole scam with the the um, manipulation of the stock market, the 1929 crash, the bankruptcy in 1933, the Emergency Bankruptcy Act, which then made their private script, their IOU, uh, legal tender that was um, the beneficiary of a fixed exchange rate. So basically in 1913, they started playing with monopoly money. In 1924, they... Uh, took over and seized the assets of the U.S. Treasury, and there hasn't been a United States Treasury Department, not a real United States Treasury Department, since 1924. So everything that you see that claims to be the Department of the Treasury and blah, 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 those are just corporate offices. They have nothing to do with us in terms of, um, of actually being our Treasury. Uh, they may be a treasury and they may uh, have functions related to accounts set up in our names and that sort of thing, but they are not, um, they're not really what they say they are. And it's the same thing with the IRS. Um, at the present time, there are three different organizations claiming to be the Internal Revenue Service. And <laughs> if, if you get letters from more than one of them at a time, it becomes very, very obvious that you've got the IRS and the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and you've got the Internal Revenue Service, upper and lower case, and the Treasury Department of the United States, and then you've got the the Internal Revenue Service in all capital letters, and and you have three different commissioners. If you go online and and you look for the... uh, address of the commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, you'll find three different addresses in D.C. So this whole thing has gotten out of control, and it's becoming more and more obvious to people that it is. Um, I I guess basically you can only tell the big lies for so long before it all comes home, and it is now uh, breaking open in such a way that it's becoming obvious to people that um, they're just dealing with governmental services corporations and that the IRS is basically just a, a bill collector and account sorting uh, organization. And uh, one of the big things that people need to understand is that there are some people who are um, obligated to pay federal income taxes. There are basically... Um, five different groups of people that are obligated to pay federal income taxes. But all the rest of us aren't. Um, The vast majority of Americans are not subject to the tax. Uh, But we have been caught up, entrapped, misinformed, and uh, left to, uh, to be the victims of 
paying a tax that we never owed in the first place. And so that... Hmm. Uh, first of all, I, I apologize for the background noise. Um, and as I said, um, I believe that um, Professor Searle is directly on the line with me. And so at this point, I cannot um, take care of that. I apologize. Um, but you're bringing forward an alternative as as part of this restoration. Um, could you explain the bank you're establishing? Okay, well, we're establishing a bank under Article 10. And if you if you read the Constitution, you'll see that the states and the people retained all of those powers in the international jurisdiction of the sea that were not specifically delegated to the federal corporation. And... Uh-huh. As a result, we retain the right to make and print lawful money. Uh-huh. Okay, and we can we can deal in gold and silver and platinum and any commodity or asset based form of currency. So that's what we're doing. Um, the problem has been is that everybody has operated on these fiat currencies for so long that there's a an educational curve and a um, a period of time where everybody has to relearn old accounting methods because asset-backed currency uses a form of um, accounting known as carriage accounting, and the okay. fiat-backed currencies have all used double accrual counting. So we, we've got quite a learning curve involved uh, and also – We're going to an entirely new system. Uh, Right now, the fiat-backed currencies are, I should just say, they're not backed by anything but hot air, really. But um, fiat currencies are all trading on the Forex, um, and they're operating under SWIFT code. And the asset-backed currencies are going to be on the IX, and uh, they'll be under the SIP system as of September 2nd. Also, every digital transaction will be run through the Monetary Authority of Singapore, or MAS. And that entire new system is waiting to come online. Um, Now, one of the big things that's changing is the blockchain technology that's making it possible to do uh, secured transactions worldwide via the web. And that was pioneered by a very brilliant man, who is now working to assess uh, the development of a blockchain alternative, an an asset-backed Bitcoin, essentially, um, that would Uh um, pretty much revolutionize banking as we know it and bring it back into a, a realm where everybody can trade safely and where things are not... Um, subject to hoarding and the sorts of of evils that we've experienced with both fiat and asset-backed currencies in the past. Because theoretically with a a Bitcoin-type blockchain currency, you can include many other commodities as um, a source of trade. And Uh you no longer have to... uh, you can you can trade your soybeans as soybeans instead of having to convert it into a standard commodity like gold in order to trade it. Right. And uh, so this is going to make some huge changes in commodity markets and in um, monet- monetary limitations and transactions. And at the same time that we've got these um, new digital currencies and and digital transaction pathways that are opening up. We even have applications for telephones where uh, someone who is in a very remote location, if they've got a cell phone, can conduct banking business. So things are are changing. Right now, uh, one of our, our friends is up in 
Barrow, Alaska, which is about as far away from anything you can possibly get on this planet. And he's setting up a telephone app banking system so that Eskimos far, far north of the Arctic Circle um, can click in and do digital banking and can manage accounts in conventional banks uh, from thousands of miles away and can trade whatever goods, services, or or other uh, materials that their communities have for goods that they need and want. And so it stands to bring a lot of people that have been cut off in places like Africa and and uh, South America, they've been unable to get the kind of banking services they needed. Well, these advances in technology are going to make a big difference. And, and backing also, all up. Um, I understand that you've also um, been having discussions and have moved ahead with um, crowdfunding the bank, so to speak, with the carrot bar system. Can you can you speak about that as well? Well, here's the problem. Uh, half the world is now trading in gold, and mm-hmm. less than less than two percent of Americans have any gold, period, at all in their portfolios, at all, or in mm-hmm. their possession. That's not a safe position for us to be in. It just is not. It's not practical. So looking at this, obviously people who have a lot of money can afford to go in and buy bullion and sock it away in the basement or wherever they're going to sock it away. But But for mom and pop who need to go down and buy bread and milk and dog food at the grocery store, uh, if the fiat collapse hits and they suddenly don't have a viable way of doing that, that can actually mean death. It can mean extreme privation. It can mean suffering. And um, so the name of the game is to find spendable gold. Uh, Mm -hmm. gold that is denominated in small enough portions so that it makes sense for daily transactions and that is affordable for average people. And uh, Carrot Bars has, you know, operated a a system that does exactly that for a number of years now, and they've established a track record and a good reputation. Now, when you cut anything into smaller portions, you wind up with packaging costs. Uh, Just Uh like if you buy a five-pound bag of sugar, it costs you more per pound than if you bought a 50-pound bag of sugar. And the same thing applies with carrot bars. So uh, you're paying for the, the smaller amount, you know, all the work that goes into cutting out that itty bitty, you know, gram amount of gold and weighing it and assaying its purity and stamping it and embedding it in the card and all this other stuff that carrot bars goes through. But on the back side of it, what you've got is something that is absolutely recognizable. The purity and the amount of the gold is recognizable. You know, you don't have somebody standing behind the cash register clamping it between their teeth or dropping little drops of acid on it to make sure that it's gold, right? Right, um, right. So there, there are some real advantages to carrot bars when you are looking at a situation where you may need to use gold to get basic commodities. And realistically, we may, we may face that. So I've pretty much recommended that everybody get some gold, uh, and then it's up to people to consider exactly what form they need it in and what amount they can afford and, you know, all those different personal decisions that go into trying to um, hedge your assets and and, uh, make sure that they continue to hold their value and all those other issues that come into it. But anybody, I would think, uh, should have maybe at least two, three months 
worth of, of basic living expenses, just, you know, food and and uh, fuel expenses set aside in a form that they can use no matter what. And that that just makes sense to me, and, and Carrot Bars has a good program for that. Well, yes, it seems to me like it's beneficial since the fiat currency system could simply evaporate and um, that it's it's wise to move resources into um, actual value. Um, is there a place where, where you can direct people um, for more information on that, Jojana? Sure. Um, there's the Carrot Bars website, carrotbars.com, spelled with a K-A-R-A-T, bars.com. Um, they have a, a good presentation. They explain what they do, why they do it, and so on. Um, and more generally, and, yes? Oh, I was going to say that and, and to disclose that I've also um, begun association with Carrot Bars, and um, there is a website you can go to at SLOPE, which stands for Save Life on Planet Earth, um, slope.thecarrotgroup.com, and that's um, carrot with a K, so in any case. Right. Um, so... Judge Anna, I mean, you are really there, um, you know, in the, um, how would you say it? The, um, if this was a ship, you're, you're there in the, you know, at the helm with those, um, you know, standing up and um, creating um, the documents for freedom. I mean, question. Um, so the Holy See wasn't involved in in this country until um, this perversion was enacted. Is that is that correct? I mean, they're this, they're part of the usurpation of um, the uh, Republican democracy. Is is that true? Oh no, no, they were involved at the very beginning. And they served as our um, trustees in the air jurisdiction. And they still are our trustees in the air jurisdiction. Uh, The problem started in 1822 um, when the international trustees acted in breach of trust. The Holy See and the British monarch were named as two of three uh, international trustees. You have the air jurisdiction, the land jurisdiction, and the sea jurisdiction, and they all function under different forms of law, okay? All right. And Mm -hmm. so uh, at the very founding of this country, the land jurisdiction was um, under the control of Benjamin Franklin, who was the first postmaster, The first United Hmm. States postmaster was the international trustee in charge of the jurisdiction of the land. The uh, British monarch uh, agreed to act as the trustee on the high seas and inland waterways. So he was responsible for protecting Americans on the high seas and protecting our shipping on the high seas and inland waterways like the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River that were navigable. And then finally, the the Pope at the time was responsible for the air jurisdiction, which is actually where we all live. Um, We live in the air jurisdiction and just touch down on either the land or the sea. So everything was going along. And then in 1822, uh, the British king at that time and the then pope got together and they signed what is known as the secret treaty of Verona and this treaty agreed that the American form of government 
was not compatible with such concepts as divine right of kings and absolute papal authority. And so they, um, they colluded together to undermine our government. And within 40 years, they succeeded. Uh, however, this was all done in breach of trust, which means that it was unlawful, and it means that they're culpable for their acts, and that they were acting in fraud when they pretended to be our trustees from that moment on. So everything that they've done from 1822 until 2008 when Pope Benedict was made aware of this situation and he uh, repented of it uh, has been in breach of trust and under conditions of fraud and deceit. Wow. Wow. And so what year was it that Pope Benedict repented? 2008. Oh, so very recently. Yes. Very recently. It's just been um, the last few years. So um, there is a very serious spiritual aspect to this. Um, and I just want to, um, um, on the paulstramer.net website, which um, readers listeners um, can follow um, much of um, Judge Anna's writing. In fact, today on um, Sunday, July 17th, it says, Sunday prayers for patriots, God have mercy on our country, and says, the coming conflict is not as much about freedom and liberty or material wealth as it is about the eternal salvation of immortal souls. And ask um, to uh, did you write that or or did Paul write that? Just uh, I mean, just out uh, of I think that curiosity. That's a Paul. That's a Paul. But, okay. You know, it, I mean, I like you look at this. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Well, I I just wanted to point out that all law comes from religion, except natural law, like you know, law of gravity. And uh, even that can be argued, it comes from the creator of this entire system of of the natural world, right? Or whatever Uh we call God or the great spirit or, you know, the magnum mysterium. Um, So all forms of law are, are rooted in religion except for natural law like that. And even that can be said to be rooted in a uh, an awareness of, of some greater ordering principle. So anyway, um, when when you look at this, yes, it is a spiritual issue. Do we want to live under the profane and venal law of Noah, which was actually overcome on the land 6,000 years ago? Or do we want to live under the law of Moses, which... You know the Ten Commandments, which began, which became the a law of the land uh, about well, thirty-seven eighty-five there about A B C. Uh, we can continue to live under the law of the land, or do we want to finally throw it all over and live under the law of the air? And that's that's another aspect because you know. Um, 2,000 years ago, the law of the air was established, and we've had the opportunity and the ability to live under the law of the air as an alternative all this time. But people have to become aware that these things exist and that these choices exist. And so um, I think that one of the big things stepping forward here is just to become aware of the fact that that the different forms of law uh, derive from religion and that our our choices of religion then dictate our law. Yes. And as a person myself espousing utopia, um, I always say that I honor the highest truths of all paths except for 
um, human and animal torture and sacrifice. You know, so it's it's not that, at least, you know, speaking for myself, it's not that we're looking at imposing our religion or world view on people as a necessity to regaining freedom and uh, sovereignty. Um, no, I don't know no. if you share that those thoughts. Yeah, I no, believe no, you everybody do. Everybody has to make choices, and the big problem that we have is that choices have been made for us just because we uh, came into the world at a specific time and place, and you know our parents had their limitations and ideas about reality that they then followed forward with as best they could. Um, You know, we've all acted in uh, kind of lockstep and in ignorance, and we haven't thought about the fact that we get to choose what kind of law we follow and and how we want to uh, function in this world and what kinds of of, um, ways and means we choose to do it. I'm convinced that if if people realized how unaccountable and evil corporations fundamentally are and how evil the law of Noah really is, uh, the vast majority would beat feet and liquidate every corporation that they're involved with. It wouldn't even be yes. a question. Yes. But so they have Judge to be aware. We, um, we have a number of... Um, people who are waiting um, in the wings, call or people who have called in. But I, I think the next thing I want to touch on, too, um, and listeners, we will um, be letting you in here shortly, but I'm sure that everyone um, with me is, is interested in learning a step-by-step path to follow to freedom so um, so that we can increase our freedom and sovereignty and not end up incarcerated. Um, So, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's been um, the big issue is how to do this um, without lose further losing our Liberty. I mean, people are paying the price. Um, So um, your thoughts or, or guidance before we um, let um, some of our callers in and see what um, questions they might have? Well, the first big thing is that the United States is not America. Somehow or other people have gotten this twisted around and have followed wrong impressions and made wrong assumptions. The United States is a foreign entity with respect to us. And always has been. So the United States is not the same as America. And everybody around the world needs to kind of get that firmly in their brain. Um, We are each born on the land in a state that is organic in nature. It's geographically defined. And that means each one of those states, those 50 organic states, is a nation state. The sovereignty is vested in the people and their states. It is not vested in the United States. With respect to us, the United States has never been a sovereign government, period, at all. We are Virginians or Ohioans or Texans or Montanans or Oregonians or uh, Californians or Wisconsinites or Vermonters or New Yorkers. We're not United Statesers, okay? That's that's number one. So your nationality that you receive at birth is your state identity, all right? So that's your nation. That is your nation state, and there are 50 of them that combined together make up the states of America, And those are the states that we owe our allegiance to, okay? So uh, the federal government is is just, it was set up as an association of states 
operating a governmental services company, all unincorporated, all acting under the law of the land because it was unincorporated. And all of the people that we sent to Congress uh, went to the Congress of the United States assembled. Okay. So Uh you have a difference there. You could also have a continental United States. um, You could have a continental Congress. Okay. Yes. The land jurisdiction represented. Let's talk about that for a moment. Brooks Agnew was my guest yesterday, and he was um, speaking about that and how that is a very important part of the process of um, establishing freedom. How is that coming along? And where can people go to learn more about that and to become more involved? In And, 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 a, and a side question, if you say, like, I was born in New York. Do I have to mm-hmm. be involved then with the um, Continental Congress for my birth state? Uh, no, you you could be anywhere, um, but the the point being that you would have standing as a national uh, of one of the states. So, say okay. you're a New Yorker born and and bred, and then when you went to college, uh-huh. you moved to Ohio and continued to live there. Okay, your uh-huh. your, uh-huh. your nation your nation is still as a New Yorker, but you're living okay. in Ohio, so you're an Ohioan too. At the same time, you're you are um, you're a landowner, and you've emigrated to Ohio. All right. Okay. So you mm-hmm. can serve Ohio where you own land, or you could serve New York, where your <clears throat> where your historical uh, nationality is. If you went back to New York. See, yes, but yes, I do see. The um, the problem is, is that we're not ready for a continental congress, in my opinion. I mean, people are just waking up and figuring out that the United States is not America. You know? Right. <laughs> uh, and and they're also just waking up and realizing that a citizen is a political status. Um, right. A citizen means that you have pledged your allegiance to a government and that you serve that government. So if you're a citizen, you're a slave, a public slave to whatever that government organization or institution wants you to do. So the moment that you say you're a United States citizen, you're claiming a foreign government as your, uh, you know, that's who you're, or what you're giving your allegiance to. And when you do that, then you are obligating yourself to obey every law and every statute and every code and every every kind of of, um, rule that the government comes out with. So when you're... Right, and you have no, and and you're not... You're not operating under inalienable rights. You're operating under privileges. Right. And right. civil rights. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're a citizen, if you claim to be a citizen, then you're a servant of government. If you are a national, then the government serves you. And it's your choice what status you want to assume. You don't have to be a citizen. But just as easily, you don't have to be a national. And the thing is, is that most of us were never aware that we had a choice. It's like we're not made aware that we have a a choice about which law form we live under. Most people have grown up being told, just arbitrarily told, that they're U.S. citizens. And, you know, because we trusted our mother or we trusted the knowledge of our grandfather or whoever told us this this little chestnut, um, 
we've grown up <laughs> saying, yeah, I'm a United States citizen. And there's also been a... Right, a, and proud of it. Proud of it. Yeah, and, and there's also a considerable amount of um, of deceit using the similar names because, of course, there's the continental United States, the 50 states we all think of, and then there's the federal United States. So when you say that you're a United States citizen, most of us being aware of the popular meaning of the the phrase, you know, we think, oh, well, of mm-hmm. course, I'm a citizen of, of, you know, the 50 states, right? But that's not right. really what they're using it as. They're talking about the foreign federal entity and their government as the United States. So uh, there's some semantic deceit that goes on there, and they make full advantage of our ignorance and uh, our willingness to to claim to be citizens of the United States or United States citizens. And they've even made it that much more confusing because, okay, you've got American state national status where you're claiming to be a New Yorker or a Texan or whatever. And then there's Uh a United States citizen, upper and lower case, which is a, a living man or woman who was say, born in the District of Columbia, all right, or Puerto Rico, or Guam. Right, right, right. in the territories. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And and then, mm-hmm. on top of that, there's this third class of citizens called a citizen of the United States. And that's a mm-hmm. corporate citizen. Um, and, and that's where we get caught up with all this abuse in the courts, is that kind of citizen is a corporation. It's not even a living man. It's it's a corporation that is named after you. And so when you see your name in all capital letters on a court document, they aren't addressing you. They're addressing a franchise of their own corporation that has a claim against it. Oh, Okay. So I got a ticket two Fridays ago, and I'm <clears throat> expected to appear in um, court on August 5th to um, answer for being on having my phone to my ear and um, apparently my seatbelt <laughs> not visibly fastened. And what was so funny is I was on the phone with, the young man who does that very fine um, radio show, um, Revolution News and Information. And I was on the phone with him, and I, you know, had just left the auto shop. And this um, highway patrol um, gentleman saw me, you know, and spun his car around, turned on his lights, and handed me a citation for which totals $190. And, I mean, it was really, you know, it it wasn't, uh, you know, like it was done on purpose. It was just, you know, coincidental that I was speaking to, you know, a young young man in the sovereignty movement. But still, it's, you know, it's how to proceed, you know, because one doesn't want to end up going in and opening a can of worms and making things worse, so to speak. You know, so, and I know that a lot of people, I'm not the only one getting this citation or that citation and not really knowing how to um, proceed in these um, waters of, of these pirates. But we can talk about that another another time or further. Um, I, I do want to start taking some, uh, I got a question um, Tom wrote in with this question before the show, and he said um, the first topic was fraudulent mortgage origination. Can I demand the return of the original promissory note, uh, non-recourse note, I signed on my mortgage due to misleading practices and fraud, and how? And if yes, who do I address it to and in what format? So, um and I might as well just lay out all the questions that Tom sent and thank all of the waiting um, listeners 
um, for your patience. His second question was voluntary submission to UCC codes. In one of your articles, you speak about the voluntary submission by the people to the UCC codes slash system enacted and governed by Congress. If, for an example, an individual fails to submit their 1040 tax form, the consequence may be imprisonment. One, what fundamental argument can you make which would withstand and or avoid criminal prosecution? He's in this thinking along the same lines as me. Um, two, have you ever or when was the last time you have filed a 1040 form? If not, was there any consequences to your refusal you had to incur? So, again, you know, we're all asking, Judge Anna, how do we stand up to these people and not get thrown in shackles and into the debtor's prisons? <laughs> well, you have to know who you are. And you have to be able to defend who you are uh, in a consistent way in court. Um, the first thing is that you never answer and you never appear. Okay? You, you never answer any okay. charges that they make against you and you never appear. When, when they call out your name or, you know, what appears to be your name, you stand up and say, I'm here in the matter of, and you never give them your name. Okay. And you enter a special appearance, and you basically are forcing them to prove that this has anything whatsoever to do with you. And if it does, that you were obligated at the time that all this took place. Now, in your case, for example, a driver's license is issued under the presumption that you are employed by or could be employed by a federal entity. Okay. Right. So if you're and then I'm engaged employee, in commercial practice. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. So if, if you're a federal employee, should you have to abide by the rules of the federal corporation that employs you? Yes, you should. Uh-huh. However, if you're not a federal employee or you are off duty as a federal employee, then none of that applies to you, does it? No. Right? So not only do they have to prove that you're a federal employee at the present moment, they have to prove that you were on duty when you were intercepted. Otherwise, all of their statutes and blah, blah does not apply to you. Also, they have to prove that the person that, um, you know, pulled you over and made this accusation was actually competent to make a judgment. And since none of the traffic cops are schooled in the law, they're really not competent to say jack about it. And, you know, you just say, are you a lawyer? Are you a judge? Are you schooled in the law and competent to make a legal uh, determination? And the traffic cop will look at you like you're crazy and he'll say no. That's it. That's that's all she wrote. Yeah. Is is there a script? Is there a script to follow, Judge Anna? I mean, where this is compiled. Um, I know you can't come and hold my hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, I wish I could. Um, every every different case is different. You know, every different state is different. They do things differently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it takes a considerable amount of experience to get up on your toes and be ready to deal with whatever they throw at you. Fortunately for you, the the worst thing that can happen is that you're going to get a $190 fine, and, you know, that's no fun, but 
It, it's a lot less yeah. serious than a hundred and ninety thousand dollar IRS charge. This is true. Um, I'm very thankful I've kept. Yeah, I don't have to deal with them in that amount. Um, but that's so. Um, to the um, to Tom's questions about can he demand the return of the original promissory note he signed on his mortgage? Do, I mean, due to misleading practices and fraud, or is there somewhere to direct him to so he can um, stand up? Um, well, you know, sure. He the answer is yes. He can. Uh, he has to be able to prove that there was uh, a fraud involved, and that's not hard to do because uh, last time I checked, we're up to 67 different elements of fraud that are common to 95% of all mortgages. <laughs> yeah, oh, my goodness. Well, mm-hmm. just, just to give you an example, these banks go out and they advertise home loans, Right. You know, you see that and you think, oh, this is a bank and they are offering to loan me money to build a home, right? That's what you think. Yes. But actually what they are, what they're advertising is they're soliciting people to come in and loan them their homes as collateral (laughs) to the bank. (laughs) Right, right. Right. And they're not they're not paying you anything to do this. They're taking money from you to do this, okay? Uh mm-hmm. toward a future repurchase agreement. It's a, a lease future repurchase agreement that they're offering. Such a deal. You get to pay five times more than they offer to loan you as credit. And they're loaning you your own credit and not telling you that they're loaning you your own credit, and they are then collecting all of this uh, mortgage payment and putting it in an escrow account under the name of this uh, corporate franchise, the all capital letters name franchise, and seizing it as abandoned funds. So, so Judge Anna, with the with the new banks that. Um, you're working to set up. And the, the name of the new bank is what? American States and Nations Bank. And this Will is it be a totally... To... Hmm? This is a totally I'm different sorry. kind of bank. <laughs> it's a different animal under a different law, everything. So I, I take it you're not going to be practicing debt usury? No. <laughs> No. Okay. What what we want to get back to, I mean, for a time the world is going to be back to the old medieval uh, gold, silver, platinum standard thing that we did for many, many generations. And um, that has its problems too. But I don't think it's going to be too much longer before the world kind of wakes up and uh, starts taking stock of reality in a whole different way and starts making use of all of the new technology that we have. And then we can get into a world where money is a tool instead of an idol. Um, yes. We yes. don't you know, we don't normally think about it in those terms, but when it talks about graven images in the Bible, it's talking about money. When it talks about... Um, Idolatry, I mean, most of us think of little tiki dolls in the marketplace, you know, or, uh, you know, a little statue of a goddess that you put on a on a pedestal and pray to. Um, mm-hmm. But that's not it at all. The, the primary idol is and has always been money. And so um, right. we would, we, we're... We're looking at moving beyond idolatry and making money into a tool. And when I say that, I mean a tool literally, just like a shovel or a rake or, you know, a front-end loader. And as you notice, money is used to do what? It's, it's used to do work. And so if you have a lot of money, you can do a lot of work. And if you have a small amount of money, you can do a little work or, or trade for 
a material thing. So the, the essential truth is that money is and should be used as a tool. And uh, you can't imagine going out in the tool shed and bowing down in front of your rake, can you? <laughs> so, no, not particularly. And the Nazarene but, master, I mean, that was the one time he got particularly agitated was when he drove the money changers out of the temple. So uh, there's there's quite a, his, you know, a historical, spiritual um, concern, so to speak. Right over um, the danger. <laughs> well, right. Um, I mean, it, it's no mistake that in the same, you know, portion he's talking about, uh, beware of those who are the synagogue of Satan, who pretend to be Jews and who are not. Um, that was a reference to those who were ethnically Jewish, but who had um, adopted the, the false worship of money. Yes. Satan's temple. Yes. See, there's there's fraud involved in money. Money has has been sold to us as a product, okay, just like, you know, widgets. Money has been sold to us as a product that we use to exchange values of things, right? But right. it doesn't it it's all smoke and mirrors. It's it's fraud on the face of it because soybeans doesn't magically convert into gold and Gold doesn't magically convert into wood, and so forth and so on. So as long as we're dealing with uh, representation of one thing for another, we're dealing with fraud. We're dealing with fiction. Um, right. And and that's why I've advocated having a world commodity standard where uh, you have a currency, all right, that stands for all commodities and all labor pools in the entire planet. And then that establishes sure. essentially an honest commodity asset-backed system because everybody has something that they can trade where they're a producer in that um, model. You know, y- right. you can produce right. labor. You, you, know, you can produce widgets. You can produce yams, you know, what, whatever. Everybody can trade in such a model without being um, a victim. And Right, right. It, it's like, do you understand how commodity markets work? Not really. Um, well, say that, that uh, you produce soybeans. You're a soybean farmer. You can go out okay. and you can you can lock in a futures contract to sell your soybeans for so many uh, dollars per pound or per bushel or you know whatever the unit measure is for for that particular commodity. At a future date, uh-huh. on such and such a date, you are promised to be paid this amount for this many soybeans. Fine. Okay. So you lock in your your future contract. And Uh you know for certain that that's what you can depend upon for that year, right? Uh Uh-huh. So most farmers will go ahead and they'll lock in a portion of their their crop or their production, their, their stipulated production for the year, and the rest they will hold back. And they'll wait and see if the price goes up. And if it does, they'll sell some more of their total production for the year. And in this way, they kind of gamble back and forth on futures production, you know, so that uh-huh. they try to get they they try to maximize how much money they get. And it's all on futures right. contract. Well, if you're not a producer, you don't have any insurance. You don't have any guarantee of a locked-in price at a certain time for a certain amount. You're just out there as a complete and utter gambler, and you have no protection. If if you're a producer and the price goes above what you agreed to sell for, well, then you've lost the difference in terms of profit, but you're not out in real money. 
if if the price goes below, well, then you're sitting there happy as a clam that you know, hey, oh, poof, I you know I managed to get what I needed to break even and make my basic profit for the year. But somebody who right. isn't a producer has no such leverage, no such protection, no hedge. They just go into that market and they get slammed around however the market goes and whatever happened that day is what happened. And as a result, commodities trading is not exactly a realm for people who are not producers. And what we're doing is we're not gold producers, we're not silver producers, and we're not platinum producers. So when we are are dealing with a asset-backed currency market, uh, and those are the only assets that are really being traded and considered within that particular realm, uh, we're right. just taking our chances like, you know, gamblers going to the casino, and we have nothing that right. backs us up or, or helps us hedge against losses or guarantees us any returns. So, you know, there are problems with asset-backed currencies that are focused on just those um, limited standard commodities, you know. Yeah. But if you if if you expand that entire concept so that you include all commodities and all labor pools, then everybody uh-huh. is a producer and everybody gets the benefit of that back and forth because you know, uh, say that the price of soybeans goes down. Well, yes. the price of beef is going to go up. You know. So right. things go right. back and forth, and they all, you know, as a whole, they balance out because you can't have you can't have overall unequal trading, if that makes sense. Yes. Well, and, it's, and so, I'm glad you bring all this up because, you know, one of the things that you know I'm hoping for and espousing is this thing I call home now, which you know, heaven on Mother Earth, now non-sectarian, but really bringing, you know, utopia, so to speak, worldwide. And the question becomes how to implement that. And I think these things that you're talking about um, are actually very helpful concepts um, to practically approach um, being able to bring such um, a time for us. So, um. Well, and the more people start to think about these things, I mean, right. it's not really so hard. It's just that our educational system and our lifestyle and everything does not right. encourage us to think about these things in terms right. of what can we do. Okay. Right. Right. We've been taught to to rely upon others that supposedly know more than we do and to rely upon politicians and rely upon institutions. And let's face it, folks, at this point they've failed us miserably, so we've got nothing to lose by thinking for ourselves. Hello? Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Professor Searle, are, are you there with us? Is that is that you, Professor? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Judge Anna. I I thought we had. Um, as I said, I brought Professor Searle in through my phone, which is plugged into the studio, and um, I apologize for the um, extra sound. Um, we still have a um a few callers on the on the line who've been um waiting patiently and i'm going to um bring in the person who has been waiting the longest which is 904 um number um who's been waiting patiently for 35 minutes if that's all right oh with goodness. you judge on it oh okay. absolutely Welcome, 
welcome listener um, 904-515. You are on the air. Um, Hello. Do you have a question? 904-515-9763. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Is okay. Um, I think we don't have a question from that caller. Thank you, caller. Let's go on to um the next. <laughs> Sorry, Judge Anna. Okay. Um, we're going to bring in. Seven one four six one eight. Welcome seven one four six one eight. You're on the air with uh, Lisa and Judge Anna. Do you have a question? Seven one four six one eight. Are you with us? Yes. Hi, <clears throat> this is Cynthia Brown. I'm I'm with you, and I was just listening in to to everything and. I'm just really shocked at uh, the way the nation is uh, <laughs> its just folding every single day. And uh, I, I'm just thankful to, to sit and listen to uh, you educate and um, cover areas that I was not aware of. Yeah, well, well don't feel bad. Hardly anyone was. Uh, probably the majority of people are not. If the majority of people really were, um, we would perhaps, and that's part of our purpose, um, and that's why, <clears throat> you know, um, the focus of this program, slope saving and sustaining life on planet Earth and um, taking care of extinction-level threats, um, our rights, <laughs> you know, um, making people aware, and um, and this is essential in saving and sustaining life on planet Earth. And most people are not aware. So, um, yeah, it is difficult. This, and when you first wake up, it's very disorienting because it's so different from what you expect and what you've been led to believe. So I, I hope that yes. you just stick with it and continue the process of, of learning and being open to new information every day because uh, there's a lot happening. Yes. Cynthia, any any questions for us? No, I'm, you... I'm pretty much just putting it all together. Um, what it really all comes down to, um, it just exposes the brainwash of, what what our nation has taught us at a very early age in school and the areas in which they did not want us to know about they they kept that from us they you know it, it's pretty clear and so it's really refreshing to know you know that we we have to be diligent in um doing our research and uh staying up to date with the current events and and how to uh, protect our rights because they're slowly being taken away. And, in fact, it seems like it's being expedited right now as far as taking our rights away from us and not allowing us to think for ourselves. Right. And we have to think for ourselves and for our families because um, if we just stand around like dumb, driven cattle, we're going to get the same thing that happens to cattle that just stand around (laughs) Don't think, you know. There, yes, yes, are and ravening wolves out there. Well, it's like it's like they're doing a purge right now. You know, they're they're deciding who's going to live and who's going to go. And you know, we we're watching a lot of um, police, uh, you know, shooting at people, and there's a lot of um, visual um, occurrences that that are unexplained as to why people are missing or why people are being incarcerated and then missing in there. Um, it explains everything. It just, 
it just confirms. Well, yeah. And being aware, we need to um, move forward as quickly and peaceably as we can to uh, correct our own political status so that we're not part of this. Uh, We need to correct our political status back to being American state nationals. Uh, We need to correct our, um, our banking. We need to correct our courts. We need to start operating our local governments because right now our local governments are hanging on by a thread. Uh, Most of the counties have been incorporated for a long time, and the people operating them have never had any experience with a lawful government. They've been running franchises of federal corporation, and the federal corporation has been operating in a criminal way since 1913. So, you know, the, the local cops, they don't know what they're doing. The local sheriffs don't enforce the Constitution or the organic public law of the land. They are code enforcers. They're mall cops. They they work for a corporation. (laughs) They're security. Well, they are. I know. I just got the image there. Yeah, those guys are just rogue right now. And these are good people, you know. No, they don't. And I live in a in a in a county in Nevada where, you know, we have very good, very good people who you know, who step into um positions in county government. And um you know, and I I trust really don't know. And in fact, you know, um I move in circles where you know, we're we're dealing and, and my county is fighting um, the BLM, their new land use plan, and you know these. I still live in a in a region where we have ranchers and hay farmers and cowboys, and you know people with a lot of integrity, and um, you know. So again, it's um, it's finding a clear path forward. I know that, and and Judge Anna knows this, but. Cynthia, I, I first learned about sovereignty back in 1991 when a group came through Eugene, Oregon called the Whole Earth Alliance, and those of us who showed up for the class got a crash course in uh, the history that led up to this. And people were trying to drive without driver's licenses, and then, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing happened and the public spin and you know, against patriots, you know, you could see it in the media suddenly, you know, in in all these um, television shows, suddenly patriots were, you know, were dangerous villains. And um, so I'm very, very um, happy um, and honored that uh, across this country that people like Judge Anna and um, Judge Darby and, and others have been working diligently so that um, when it's now that it's time to um, bring the masses forward, because I mean, we're facing, they're getting ready to put the, what try and put the TPP in and, and give even our, you know, our national sovereignty as the, as the fake corporate government over to um, the international um, conspirators. It's it's time right now, as you said. They're, you know, they're looking at um, eliminating um, 90 plus percent of life on planet Earth, and and I'm not for that. And I trust Cynthia, you're not either. <laughs> and I know no, they're doing it right and, now. Yes, they're doing yes, it right now, are. but the, it, it was like um, it was like a frog pot, you know. They they just let you know us all jump in the pot, and they just were turning up the volume by little you know ticks, and all of a sudden we got complacent and we were comfortable and we were falling asleep. But meanwhile, they were cooking us all along, and now that the heat is up. They've got all these different diversions going on, so we don't know what to follow because we're we're all starting to, you know, try to jump out of that pot and figure out 
where our place is on earth. And as we're yes. trying to establish our citizenship, not our citizenship, our national, they're trying to label us as sovereign citizens, an uh, enemy of the state, because they don't want as you to know. Yes. Exactly. And what they've done now is they've created a manual called the Sovereign Citizen uh, Manual, which they um, can hold you a a terrorist or a enemy of the state because on, on those um, specific labels, they find you a threat. And, and, and it's actually information that um, relates to the records of our properties as well. You know, they don't want you owning your own property. And if you fight that, then you're an enemy of the state. I mean, they're purging like crazy out here in California. Well, that's because yeah. they're, you're still listed as a United States citizen. And you need to get out from underneath that as soon and as well as you can. And, and that's uh, the one way to one? No, that's just United States citizenship. You do not want to uh-huh. be United States citizenship of any kind. You want that to be gone. You don't want state citizenship either. You want to be a state national, someone who is a completely private one of the people. Okay? You don't want to work in any kind of state office. Those of us that do have to be educated to do it because otherwise you can get into all sorts of of problems. When someone calls you a sovereign citizen, you just step back on your heels and you look at that person and you say, I'm no sovereign citizen. A sovereign citizen is an oxymoron. It's an impossibility. You can't serve right. the government as a citizen and be sovereign over the government at the same time. So that's just pure and honest BS. And, you know, you have no have no qualms calling them on it. And, you know, just look them right in the eye. I'm no sovereign citizen. I know better. So, Judge right. Otto, where can you direct people if they, as we want to educate ourselves and and speak properly, so as not to incriminate ourselves? Well, the very best thing is to just collapse the, the construction trust that they've set up in your name. And for a long, long time, we thought that it was all under the Uniform Commercial Code, but in keeping with their semantic deceit tactics, they also set stuff up under the Universal Construction Code. And the primary culprit that is uh, always being attacked in these court actions is a construction contract trust. And you're all capitals first, middle, last name. So what you do is you um, basically change your name from the all capital letters name to upper and, upper and lower case, and then you go in and you file a, a certificate of assumed name And then you make a non-UCC1 filing, which is just you go to the Secretary of State or the Uniform Code Compliance Office in the state, and you there's a a UCC1 form has a little box that you check, and you fill that out a specific way, very very simple, and you record this claim against the name or names, and then you take that, you bankrupt that name, that all capital letters name. You you liquidate it under Chapter 7. So then you get rid of it. It's gone. The United States citizen no longer has any power over you. And, And that whole scam goes away. Now, for more specific information about that and exactly how that's done, uh, you can go to uh, the Lighthouse Law Club on the web. The White House Law Club, all right? Lighthouse. 
lighthouse as in lighthouse, you know, a, a lighthouse not white house. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, lighthouse Light, law lighthouse club. Lighthouse law club. And uh Mark Emery and uh his his friends uh are you know, leading the charge there and Patrick Devine and, and so many other fine people are uh, making that possible. And that is a really good remedy. It's the, the first really good, complete remedy that I've seen. And that, Wonderful. Uh, what how, that does, how long does that usually take to complete? Oh, well, it depends upon the, the workload of the local agencies that have to do it because once you do all this, uh, the probate courts have got to disgorge that and the Secret Service and the um, United States Marshals have to come in and do a complete audit. And when they do that, an awful lot of, of uh, dirt gets dug up because you've been you've been the victim of a lot of, of uh, crime. Well, I'm I'm glad you say that because I'm fighting a illegal foreclosure right now where they're trying to bring me into an unlawful uh, uh, detainer court where my name is being used with an identical name where they've actually changed my race and oh wow they have oh, wow. ran a muck that is bad. They've stolen the, all of the wealth and and the last asset they're coming back for is the house. But they've uh, well, put debt on me. Well, don't even stop to think about it. Just get yourself together and go to White House Law Club and learn how to do this pro- this process. Uh, there's a YouTube video called Settle All Debts or Settle All Claims, and it explains all the basics there. And it's simple to do. It's fast to do, and it's absolutely deadly to their system. It it clears out that false person that they've put up in your name. It discharges all debts that have been held against you, and it uh, gives the remainder of your estate back to you, which means your house comes back to you, uh, your land that's been stolen comes back to you, uh, Judges that have have knowingly uh, done this get arrested, um, and you you know most often people walk out with a tidy sum of cash to tide them over. Um, but it like I say, I wouldn't wait. I would go ahead and I would you know get educated as fast as I could and get in there and get going because. Um, you know, meantime, I and my party hardies are seeking a systemic answer to this. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're looking for a way to clear everybody out of this system, and to um, to make this happen for all Americans, without everybody having to ha- go through the process of learning how to do this. Now, this particular solution, which is brilliant and which I approve of. Uh, It's relatively simple, and you use the power of the court against the rats. So, you know, part of the brilliance of it is that it uses the court system against those that normally use the court system against you. Um, So you're finally getting support out of the court system that you deserve. Uh, Another aspect of this is that it collapses that that entire person in trust. It's liquidated. It's not just bankrupted. It's gone. And you never have to worry about dealing with it or any of its brothers and sisters again. And that's that's another gigantic step forward out of the darkness. Um, you finally get your title to your land back. And you know, and by that I mean the split title. You are suddenly the owner in in due course and holder in due course, and nobody can mess with you anymore. So this has a lot of advantages to it. It has no downsides that I can see, and uh, it's been working very well. Uh, so those of you that are suffering foreclosures and you know you need help right now. 
uh, I would do that without a second thought. And um, so again, those, Judge, on to tell people where to where to find that information. It, it's www lighthouse as in you know a lighthouse on the coast that guides ships in from the sea. Mm-hmm. Okay, lighthouse law club. So it's www lighthouse law dot club. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Um, we have. Um, we're we're winding the show down now. Um, oh. We're um, Judge Anna. Um, I hope that um, we need to continue this. Um, and um, let's see. Five six one two five five. I'm going to bring you in briefly. Um, I know you've been waiting patiently for fifteen minutes. Yes, five six one two five five. You're on the air with us. Hi, Judge Anna. Uh, I just have a quick question, if I may. I'm a naturalized champion. Does it make any difference between uh, people that are born here to we can become a? Now I'm in Florida, so can I become national, or does that how does that does that make any difference? Well, thank you. You're in, you're in kind of a quasi. Uh, one of those statuses that's hard to give a definitive answer because uh, you can claim a state national status uh, because you live in Florida, right? Right, right. Uh, And you've gone through the naturalization process. Yes. Uh, But I think that the better thing is to uh, go ahead and see if you can get through this process of having the person liquidated okay. and adopt adopt the name, the upper lowercase name, with a certificate of assumed name. Okay. And just adopt the upper and lowercase name as your name. And um, <clears throat> then that becomes your political status, and that gives you the option of living on the land or the sea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Judge Anna, we have um, two minutes left in the show. Like I say, we're going to have to do this again. And I apologize to all the callers who we weren't able to take. And listeners, I'm, for more information on Judge Anna's work, please visit AnnaVonWrights.com. That's A-N-N-A-V-O-N-R-E-I-T-Z.com. And Anna has two books that both very important to freedom, Disclosure 101, a compilation of some of her earlier writings, and a book called You Know Something is Wrong When?, an American Affidavit of Probable Cause. And both books are available at Amazon. And um, to support and become part of the Utopian Reality Slope Earth Aid Movement, contact whitebuffalonation at gmail.com and visit wbnslope.weebly.com and our White Buffalo Nation Facebook page. And you can support the Slope Mission at gofundme.com backslash slope. And the monies help keep this mission going as we work to get solutions to all the people and life on Earth and keep this radio show on the air. Thank you so much, Judge Anna. Um, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, thank and you. I'm going thank to, you, everybody. I'm going to... Oh, I'm going to let this one last caller in, Anonymous. <laughs> I always like, hello, Anonymous. Um, we're closing down the show. Did you have a quick question or statement for Judge Anna? All right. Okay. So, listeners, together, let's save life on planet Earth. That's yours, mine, and all of ours on and in the land, waters, and air. Thanks for joining us. 
Uh, Till next time, this is Lisa Wolf for Slope, Save Life on Planet Earth, Earth Aid. Have a wonderful free weekend. And let's give the Earth and all her children freedom from fear, lack, and degradation and bring the utopian reality now that we all long for. Thank you, Judge Anna. Take care. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. All right. Thanks, everyone. And um, God bless us all. Amen. Thank you. When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be hard. Like early 90s heavy metal hard. I'm yelling and screaming and I'm loud. Roar. Geico makes it easy. You can review and update your policy or report a claim on Geico.com or the Geico mobile app. Because shouldn't we all have a little less stress in our lives? I'm not even upset about anything. 